Hey, y'all. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to a very special episode of Sweet Tea and TV's Extra Sugar. Hey, y'all. We're going off book, and we're going to pivot ever so slightly from what we typically do, teasing out a topic from Designing Women, to instead chatting about another TV show that's near and dear to our hearts, The Crown. <laughs> The crown. The crown. The crown. <laughs> it's either German, French, or a British accent. I don't know. Anyways, The Crown is a prestige TV series on Netflix, in case you don't know. And it first aired in 2016. It's inspired by real life events, a fictionalized dramatization of the story of Queen Elizabeth II, and the political and personal events that shaped her reign, tells us Netflix. The show was created by Peter Morgan, who is also known for The Queen, Last King of Scotland, and Frost Nixon. The first four episodes of the sixth and final season dropped on November 16th, and the final six episodes drop on December 14th, which I do believe is the same day this Extra Sugar releases, but don't hold me to that because calendars are tough for me. (laughs) We're going to talk about the first four episodes here, and then we'll come back at a later date to talk about the last six, which should be after the holiday because right. we have the holiday to contend with first and then we'll come back and talk about royalty. This feels as good of a time as any to say, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it yet, we will definitely go into spoiler territory and then some. So, yep. And then the last thing I'll say is, for those of you who have been with us for a while you probably don't need the explanation for why we're covering this but if you are new you may be wondering why is this happening and I'm happy to tell you why am I here yes well we ask the same question every day <laughs> so Nikki and I are both well-established Anglophiles before sweet tea and TV was even an apple in our eye a sweet tea in our eye whatever we watched Harry and Meghan's royal wedding together. Indeed, Nikki and her daughter Carolina threw us a coronation celebration earlier this year. And this time last year, we did a special episode on the Harry and Meghan docuseries on Netflix, season three, episode 25, if you'd like to hear that one. And a disclaimer, fascination with the royal family is not endorsement. We are indeed Americans with our own set of problems. So <laughs> the joke is... Indeed on us. I'm glad you said that because I was sitting here thinking, I just want to be clear. That doesn't mean I'm a royalist or an Elizabethan or whatever. Every time I have to say it, you know, because I think people are like, oh, you like a monarchy, do you? Right, right. Did I say that I like a monarchy or did I say I like drama? I love the drama. I also was giving it some thought, too, because I think there, one could argue, I'm going to argue, that there are some connector points with designing women. At least one we've shared before, but I've thought about some new ones, okay? So the first thing is the show itself, designing women, that is, seems to have some kind of fascination it's, um, with the British royals. Oh, mm-hmm. They've referenced them many, many, many times. Mm-hmm. Or how about Diana and Delta Burke? Different on the surface, but perhaps more connective tissue than one might think. Here, just go with me, okay? Okay. Both women went through rigorous training, one to be a princess, the other to be a pageant queen. Both are very charismatic. They both have that indefinable quality that draws every eye in the room, that makes you a star, but also makes you a target. Speaking of being targeted, they were both hounded by the media, particularly the tabloids, The media was endlessly fascinated with both of their bodies, albeit in different ways, and they both fetishized and consumed them. Both women took back their own narratives at different points, using the media to do so. Both were trying in their own ways to fight a larger system, the royal family, or Hollywood. Different, yes, and yet both are similar and systems. There was even some overlap in the timelines of their respective stories with some of the biggest things happening in the early 90s. We will talk about this in a future Extra Sugar, but there was a Delta um, bombshell interview with Barbara Walters in 1990. On the other hand, Andrew Morton's tell-all book, Diana, Her True Story, it comes out in 1992, a book it's later revealed Diana directly contributed to. So... What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> I, think 
an excellent intro. I have to confess before we start that... Um, you didn't watch the first four episodes of The Crown. <laughs> no. So I fudged up. And so we're working on sort of a compressed timeline to prepare for this particular episode. So, uh, and these are very long episodes, The Crown is. It's a very big investment. Mm -hmm. So I started watching and something just felt weird to me. Like I just felt like I'd never seen it before, but it felt like they had a lot of ground to cover to get to what I thought I understood they were covering in the first episodes of this final season. I got halfway through the fifth season and realized that I was watching the fifth season, not ah. the sixth season. Oh, well, that's good. So I missed kind of. the, fix, the fifth season. And this is sort of that thing I've told you about before. There are some shows I just can't bring myself to finish or to bring to completion. And I think The Crown is one of them that if we weren't doing this, I probably wouldn't see it. I probably would be watching. Like, I love the show, but it's finishing and there's like a sense of completionism that I just hate. So... I had to skip the second half of season five to skip to season six. But when I made that comment in one of our documents that there was something in the first episode I already had to Google. Yeah, I was watching season five when that happened. Season six, this is much more like recent royal history to me. I understand and identify with a lot more of this. So I want to start with that preface because (laughs) there's half of season five I haven't watched. So any spoilers you got there, save them. Okay, and this was the first time you've watched season five, then? Yep. Ah, okay. I didn't know if you just didn't remember what had happened. No, she met Dodie for the first time at the beginning of season five, and I was like, good Lord, how are they going to get to what they're going to get to? Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. (laughs) So when we talk about what we wanted to talk about first, which was sort of talking about show favorites, Uh uh, I can only use seasons one, two, three, four, Half of season five and now half of season six. It's most of the show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm missing something. So what do you, at the risk of starting vague, what do you like most about the show? So one of my favorite things about the series is that every two seasons we get a change of the guard where different actors come in to play the queen and other members of the royal family or other key characters. And that's because the show is covering roughly 60 years. So we can't really have a 25 year old play a 75 year old. I mean, that's just, that's just silliness. They tried to do it in Harry Potter and it didn't work out. You do like the de-aging thing and Mm -hmm. it's just weird. So that is the very first thing that I would say is a favorite for me. Okay. How about you? I, I think that the sets are really amazing to me and probably should have looked into this a little bit more how they do it because there were parts again when I was watching season five thinking it was season six Mm -hmm. I was like oh my gosh these like sweeping shots of the palaces and the sweeping shots of the grounds it's really darn impressive because my understanding is the royal family you know they don't confirm much ever publicly um, but they confirm a lot privately that makes it into the press my understanding is this show is not really doing it for them they're not super excited about it especially later seasons exactly Mm -hmm. so I don't know that they would have given permission to get those sweeping shots of palaces so it must be digital somehow but the cinematography is beautiful yeah I love it every single time I only know from listening to a podcast that there are certain things that are CGI'd. So um, in this season, which I think was a complaint for one of the podcasters that I was listening to. In this season. Okay. But not, I don't think in previous seasons. Um, But I I agree because obviously they are not sitting there in Buckingham Palace. That's not going to be allowed. But I think they do a pretty darn good job with the scene setting and then bringing into certainly something that has been built. Right. Or whatever the case is. Um, so I will tell you that another favorite thing for me about this series is just the writing. I think it is so good. And you kind of see this happen in several different ways. I mean, we're talking about some, it's six seasons now. Mm-hmm. So you've got a lot of content to pull And it's from. 10 episodes and each episode is like conservatively. Yeah, I was going to say conservatively 50 minutes to 60 minutes. Yeah. So I the character development is probably some of the best that I've seen. And each character is just so perfectly drawn. Most, with very few exceptions, are pretty well used across the seasons, even as the cast changes. 
the different relationships are so layered, so nuanced and rich. Uh, you know, maybe it helps that there is so much to draw on from real life, and that's true, but it could go sideways in the wrong hands. Uh, both through the writing and with the camera, to your point, they go through these painstaking efforts to show us repeatedly a deep truth about the human condition. We are all from very different circumstances. Some of us are poor. Some of us are queens. Some of us have everything. Some of us have nothing. And yet we all go through the same ups and downs, life, death, marriage, divorce, lost love, second chances. You get the idea. And the show may be centered on the queen, but I love that they take us on these little side journeys Sometimes with main characters or even peripheral characters, but it usually threads us back to the main narrative or maybe deepens our understanding of this world. So it's never without a greater purpose. I was reading a review recently that said actually this show intends to not be about the queen because Peter Morgan did the queen and that was sort of his attempt at showing the history of the royal family through her eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of the side stories it all has to be about her ultimately like they say multiple times like she is the alpha and the omega of the family she's the one they're all working for um but they they spend so much time talking about these other stories because like creatively he needed something else to explore but i agree with you i like the storylines and i like hearing about some of the characters that i know less about like the there was a, a couple of seasons where they focused on prince philip and this, the show changed my perception of him and made him more endearing to me. I didn't, I didn't really have, and I don't, I mean, I don't know how true any of it is, but I didn't have a really good feeling about him. And I, I can't remember if it was season two or season three. One of the seasons changed him and made him more endearing to me. Um, it has made me feel more strongly about Charles and not in a good way. Um, so mm. it's definitely influenced my perception of the royal family. I really, on the note of the characters, the costuming is top notch in this show. And sometimes the costume actually makes the character. So all I know about Princess Anne is a top knot and like knee length skirts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Beyond the fact that she's just sort of generally a badass. Mm -hmm. But like when I think, when I think Princess Anne, I have a very clear image that comes to mind. And this season in particular, they had um, Claudia Harrison in oversized vests and knee length skirts like multiple times. And all I could see was Anne. She just looks just like Anne. It was really impressive. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think in this season in particular, um, so much of what we're seeing already is probably some of the most photoed moments of all time. And when they put the Diana pictures side by side, like the original picture with the character, uh, they're about to cry. (laughs) Okay. No, I mean, no, keep talking. That's just how weird I am. When they put those pictures side by side, um, they definitely take some creative liberties. Like they ha- they don't have exact replicas of the clothes, but like if that is not emblazoned in your memory, which is what they're banking on, like you remember enough to know she's in a one piece floral bathing suit. Mm-hmm. If that's enough for you, then they can really make you feel like you're watching something real. And uh, maybe we'll talk about this in a little while. I don't want to go too far. This season in particular was hard to keep real from fiction for me because um, it feels real because we kind of lived through some of this stuff and it feels so real. And so I had to keep reminding myself multiple times more than I had in previous seasons. Like this isn't, this isn't real life. This isn't a documentary. They didn't just film these people. Mm-hmm. So the things that it makes you feel about Diana, the things that it makes you feel about Charles, they're not necessarily fair mm-hmm. emotions or feelings, characterizations you're putting right. on them. And I have to keep reminding myself of that. Yeah. Um, do we want to talk about, do you have more things you like about the show you want to talk about or you want to move on to your favorite season or episode? We could go on to favorite seasons. Um, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Uh, so at the risk of being basic, I'm going to put season yeah. one up there. Okay. Um, because Claire Foy, I thought was incredible. Oh, yeah. Um, it sort of set the stage, that that season set the stage for what feels like a very singular show to me. There aren't a lot of Game of Thrones comes kind of close. It's all about royalty, but in a very different timeline, in a very different world. Nothing else like this. Very different. 
nothing else like this. This uh-huh. show is a real life, like you said, a real life dramatization. So there were historic events in season one that I've never known about. Seeing Queen Elizabeth as a young woman, I was going to say girl, that's why I put my quotes up, but a young woman, seeing her as a young woman inheriting the crown was just like a very crazy adventure to go on. And it just set the stage for, I think, the rest of the seasons. And I I really liked that. I I love that take. Uh, So I will tell you that right now I've, so watching the latest season has put me in a total rewatch. Oh, but I've, for one reason or another, I've, so I watched season five to prepare for season six. And then, um, so we were on the same timeline, <laughs> kind of. And then, um, so then watch season six, and then I was like, "Well, what happened in four? Mm-hmm. Go back." And so I've been watching them. So I went back and I watched four, and then three. Now I'm going back and watching one, and I'm ending on two. I'm about halfway through it right now. That is a very long way of saying I have almost rewatched the series again. Oh my god! Which is what I could have said. Um, you'd be amazed what you can. Uh, tackle in a workout in the morning and watching a show <clears throat> but I think it's very tough to say what my favorite season is because there is a part of me that it depends on the season I'm watching but if I absolutely have to pick one I would say four and I think it's the perfect amount of Diana which I was when we hadn't gotten to Diana yet I was like when are we going to get to Princess Diana when are we going to get there and then we got there and I was like it's like that thing where I just got too excited I think and so what I like about four it's the perfect amount of her without losing the rest of the cast I also really like the addition that season of Margaret Thatcher including her up and down relationship with Queen Elizabeth I think it is it's such a nice mechanism to talk about larger things that are going on in the world both then but that still matter today there is a lot of um, gender politics it's just really interesting this is um, really hard though for me to talk about also a favorite episode because you know there's I have several different contenders in mind but if I'm going to pick one I'm going to say Season four, episode two, and this is where Margaret Thatcher and later Diana are put to the titular Balmoral test. Um, what, titular? The word titular. <laughs> it's okay as long as you just say the whole word and not just the first part. That's what I hear from Designing Women. We'll get there, guys, in another episode. But so Balmoral is the castle where the royal family goes to retreat for the summers and the holidays. And then the Balmoral test is a vetting or a hazing, depending on how you look at it, where the royal family tests new guests to see if they fit in. And they basically have to prove, can we be a good sport when the royal family turns up the heat? And in the episode, Thatcher's visit is an epic failure while Diana's is a triumph. And um, But you also get this, the other thing that's in the sauce is like, it, it doesn't matter how well Diana's going to do. Prince Charles doesn't love her. And that is also made apparently clear. Like, we know that. (laughs) But this episode is kind of like a tipping point for that as well. Yeah, I think um, season four was also one of my favorite seasons. I didn't even try to pick a favorite episode. Uh, One, because I haven't rewatched the series recently. So I couldn't tell you what happened in every individual episode. Um, But also because I don't know that I could ever do that. It's just there are elements of all of them. Uh, But I did really like season four. And I just remember feeling really sad watching the beginning of their relationship because I know how it ends. Like I know what's coming. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember feeling really sad about that. I will say one of the struggles I've had with the Diana thing, I didn't get, I don't, I have a little bit of a hot take sitting across the table from you with my take on Diana. Uh, Don't be so sure. (laughs) Um, I wasn't like super excited for her to come. I think the pre, the reason I love like season one and maybe even a bit of season two so much is because it's like so far removed that like it feels like history and it doesn't matter how accurate or inaccurate really it is at the end of the day. When we get in the later seasons, we're talking about some people who are still alive, some people who are no longer alive. Some stories we'll never know because they're not here anymore. Some stories we'll never know because they'll never tell it. And so it starts to get a little bit, it feels very one-sided. And and they say that in this um, new season, uh, Dodie says it, remember who I really was. And like sort of this concept of don't make me mythical because I'm dead. Mm -hmm. That line, that one singular moment is almost how I feel about Diana. She has been mythicized to a point 
that she can do no wrong. And I'm not sure that's fair. I want to be very clear that in more recent years, that myth has really tumbled down around me. And I'm yeah. okay with that because I, I agree with you. I think it's dangerous for us to lionize people like that and yeah. to put them on pedestals. Like I wouldn't want to be put, please don't ever put me on a pedestal. I'm a piece of crap. And I don't need anyone trying to make me into something fancy. Um, I wouldn't want it done to me. And it's not fair for me to do it to anyone else. I think Diana was an incredibly flawed person, just like any other person. Mm -hmm. She just had a lot of really cool attributes and came at a very specific time. And there's just like a lot of things there that like where all the stars aligned to make her what she was. Um, But at the end of the day, she's a person. So, um, and I think if anything in kind of digging even more in, and in recent years, and we'll talk more about this, like, um, how human she was is just so much more apparent. Mm -hmm. I actually am not sure the show goes far enough will be my criticism. Right. So I think that's what I was struggling with. My, my in-depth knowledge of Diana pretty much begins and ends with her death. Uh, I know about the interviews and I know about the challenges with Charles, but my real life knowledge of her really sort of is like, I remember watching her funeral. I remember thinking how sad, like this feels momentous. I remember thinking that and I know about the legacy she left with her kids. In the last couple of years, we're seeing so much of the messiness of that, which is not her doing. Obviously she had very little influence on their lives in the grand scheme of things, but, um, I don't know. I just don't know that much about her. And watching this makes me feel like they have assigned some positive things to her that I'm not sure really were positive. But that's not what we're talking about. We're still just talking about her favorite season or episode. Um, do you have anything else you want to say in this category? I'm skimming through my notes to see if there's anything. I'll just be sad if I leave it out. Uh, do, the only, do we want to talk about whether or not favorite cast or anything. So that's like. next on the list, okay. yeah. So you already mentioned at the top they change every two seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to go like through the entire cast, but just for anyone who hasn't really watched it, um, there were three Queen Elizabeths, there were three Phillips, three um, Margarets, three Annes, three Charleses, um, and then two Dianas. So... I started to go through, I have the list of actors here. I started to go through it, but maybe it's better just to talk about maybe your favorite. Do you have a favorite queen? Oh, okay. Well, I can still do it that way too. Yeah. Um, Olivia Coleman. I did it wrong. Uh, there's no wrong. Um, I'm just trying to keep up with you. So Olivia Coleman um, is, uh, I just think she gives Queen Elizabeth so much life and so much depth. It, it, it doesn't take away from, um, I, the other two actors that portrayed the queen at all, you can see me in real life blinking on names and you've already said one of them. Claire Foy. Claire Foy. Like I, I am loving that performance right now because like I said, I'm about to wrap up my rewatch and seeing how she transforms from a young, I mean, she's 25, but that's a very young person into the queen Elizabeth that is more in line with what we did know uh, is transformative and amazing i just love olivia coleman i mm. think she is just absolutely everything she did uh, a great job with the character I, I will say amelda staunton has been my least favorite queen i don't think she's been given a lot to work with compared to previous seasons they've made her really really cold and it almost feels like there's been a shift in her character mm -hmm. like i never found olivia coleman cold yeah, I think that is, a, well, there's a couple of scenes, but on the whole, I agree with yeah. you. Um, I think uh, in listening to some other people's takes who are really big, like royal family watchers and also um, very knowledgeable about Peter Morgan's The Queen, that Helen Mirren didn't play it that cold either. And it what like... In the Queen is very similar to the, and I haven't seen it. It's in my queue to watch, and I was going to try and do that before. See, I can't. There are some things I can't get to. I did not get to watch the Queen in order to <laughs> to have this conversation today. But like, um, uh, the first four episodes of this season are very similar to 
that movie because it's looking at the same thing, which is like the queen trying to figure out how to deal with Diana's death and to make the decision to leave Balmoral and go into London for the funeral. All those things is really what it's circling and it does it in two very similar and yet very different ways when it comes to the character. So favorite Queens is <laughs> yours is obviously Claire Foy. Cause you've yes. always, yeah. Yeah. I thought she just was so glamorous and beautiful. And this is me romanticizing that time period, the way Charlene romanticizes world war two, but it, it was also just sort of breathtaking to see her become a young queen. Uh, we don't have to go character by character. Do you have a di- like a different way you looked at it i just did like these are my favorite cast members i think okay. they're all falling in seasons three and seasons four i guess i was just trying to kind of keep it contained somehow and this was the only way i knew to do it to your point it's not an easy exercise because there is so many cast changes and blah 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 blah. Uh, what i do think is important to say here because of what you said at the top is that so for you i it doesn't sound like um prince charles uh, won any favors in your eyes for me I feel completely different. What? I spent my entire life not being someone who could understand him at all. And Josh O'Connor playing him in seasons three and four almost single-handedly made me reconsider my feelings about who is now King Charles. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, he's so self-pitying. He's just yeah. always so like, but I've been given me- such an unfair lot in life and i'm like you live in a palace dude and i'm not one to say every single one of these i'm not one to say like you minimize other people's feelings because of their life circumstances Mm -hmm. but i do think there's something to be said for acknowledgement of Mm -hmm. your privilege and life circumstance he gets called out on it a few times throughout the series yeah but Man, that's just a really, that's a real trigger point for me. I think that's the same for Princess Margaret. I see that over and over again. But I think it's also kind of seeing these threads again. Going back to that point I made earlier about even though there are things that we can just never understand about like someone born into these particular set of circumstances, they're so wildly different than the rest of us. On the other hand, I I can understand lost love. And I can understand, like I can at least like, there is something tragic. It does set up this tragedy for him that he loves someone else, wanted to be with her, is forced into a marriage, and then wildly changes a bunch of people's lives. I'm not saying that. Um, it's just the first time I think I ever saw anything from his perspective at all. Mm. And again, to your point, we are watching a dramatization mm-hmm. of real life. So I don't know. Actually, I think one of my takeaways from the entire series is the show is a huge Charles sympathizer in my eyes. Definitely this season. Um, Because again, because it's so dramatized, like I don't know what, and I'm going to get into this in a little while. I don't know what his reaction to some of these events was. I don't know if he really said some of these things. Um, But it definitely, so when I started watching season five, thinking it was the last season, I was like, holy crap, they are going for, they're going for him now that he's been coronated because where I started was the, was Camilla gate and the tapes. And I mean, that's the first half of season five. Um, that's where I was coming in thinking that was the final season. I was like, Holy crap. They really ago. wanted to a uh, right. I was like, they really wanted to come for him right after the coronation. Now that I'm watching season six, it is much more sympathetic to him. Yeah. Um, I have to say Vanessa Kirby played Margaret so that was Claire Foy's counterpart in the first couple of seasons. I think she is captivating. And I thought her entire performance was beautiful. Speaking of tragic and speaking of a, a circumstance that's just all the way around kind of sad, she did a beautiful job. Helena Bonham Carter played her the next, she was the next circulation. She added a beautiful darkness to her, but almost too dark. In, in very body. Like, yeah, uh, that, so that was my favorite. Helena bottom. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I think, it, but I think part of it is too, is like, um, it is, I kind of like seeing that trajectory though. And I think, because she is also like the canary in the coal mine 
for what happens with Charles. Because right. she's like, hey, hey, remember when you did this to me like right. 20 years ago or however right. long ago it was? Like, uh, and I think she continues to be this voice of reason, even though she's going through so much hardship. Mm-hmm. And I I don't like to see someone be in pain, but I do I do like the intricacy of that character. How kind of you. And isn't that nice? I'm so sweet. <laughs> um, the uh, I do like the intricacy of, um, you know, when she is... Uh, clearly having some 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 real like depression issues mm-hmm. and goes and discovers about the family uh that they had locked away because they had mental health issues right um and i liked um i like learning about that because i think it it again this is one of those things where a side story like that really deepens our understanding both of her Mm-hmm. and the world of the show mm-hmm. that's so smart and i think they used her really well in that and i love the episode where she winds up going to the states to be with um president johnson and i just think that i think that they that is another example of them using a character really well to do a thing and setting up this tension that is just throughout the seasons between her and her sister mm-hmm. also known as the queen <laughs> What, do you have other favorite characters you want to talk about? I, th- those were mine. Coleman, O'Connor, and uh, Carter. I okay. think the one thing I have to say, though, because you mentioned Game of Thrones earlier, mm-hmm. and it just hit me this season, all three of the men who play um, uh, Philip are portrayed by someone in the Game of Thrones universe. Oh, that's funny. Crazy. That's funny. Yeah. So Matt Smith is Prince Damon Targaryen in the new sp- spinoff that's the prequel. Tobias Menzies is Edmure Tully, and Jonathan Price is the High Sparrow. What? That's really funny. That's funny. Blue Jonathan mind. Price was my favorite, Philip, by the way. Oh, yeah. I, I don't like um, Menzies. I don't oh. really care for him. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> moving on <laughs> poor Tobias uh, he doesn't care what I think no do <laughs> nor I so um, <laughs> not to you he doesn't care what I think what I think I do why care. am you I here me all the time um so let's dive into season six with our top reactions although I would argue that we've been dabbling in season six all along yeah <laughs> but what were your first blush reactions to these first episodes so I think initially, like I said a minute ago, I was thinking that I was thinking about what is the show trying to say about Charles and where are we in time? So our time or there or then both. Time. Okay. Both. Okay. But but thinking also like where we are now. So they they ended up laying out I'm trying to decide if this is an, an old note or not. Say it and I'll tell you. Maybe. <laughs> he was kind of laying out a vision for a more modern and forward-looking monarchy. Was that season five? I think so. Okay. That's an old note, then. But it sort of, it does kind of carry on, though. I mean, I think that's sort of the push-pull from the minute he is an adult. Right. Um, in seasons, even back to season three um, and a forward. I do wonder, like, again, so it's, I tried so hard not to read too many reviews because I didn't really want other people's opinion Influence. to sway mine. Yeah. In general, like, the reviews I've read of The Crown really aren't that great. Like, in general, there's a lot of criticism about, like, slowness, a lot of criticism about the dramatization. Like, but what else are they going to do? They don't have transcripts of these people's lives. So I tried not to read too, too many of them. But one of the ones I read really talked about how – the show really is, you called it a Charles sympathizer a minute ago. Um, and I was thinking he just had his coronation. This series is coming out now. He is not a huge fan of the show from what I've heard. And what is what is it trying to tell us or what is it telling us? And my takeaway was that they are Charles sympathizers because I think a lot of the stuff around Diana, like the queen said it at one point, he caused her so much pain in her life. And then at the end, he was like, now we're going to do right by her. Uh, but I did appreciate that line where he said, you know, I'm going to do right by her in death. I mm-hmm. thought that was nice. Um, it was well written. It was well written. It was the, the whole, that whole scene right there was really well written. But that's yeah. what I was thinking about going into this season when I finally got into the right season. I was so thinking sorry. about where are we in time with Charles and what are they trying to tell us? Yeah, I think, so I just, I, I will say that it has also been hard for me not to read things. Um 
apparently, it, and I'm 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 doing this from memory, so I apologize if I'm getting this wrong. But if I understand correctly, Peter Morgan, when he first sets out and he starts doing a lot of this years ago, he is much more critical of the royal family. As time goes on. I think he almost brings himself around more to understand their particular set of circumstances. He gaslit himself. <laughs> and, um, he's, and I do think he has become much more sympathetic over the years. And I do think you start to feel that in the narrative of the show in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, and suffer- it, it's such a tough job. Uh-huh. And I don't mean to ever take away from how complicated their lives are. Oh, Even I didn't in, know if you meant to write the show. Well, that too. But no, like the, I can understand why he maybe would come around learning more about them and learning more about I the structure so. yeah. and the functioning. I get that. Or some of the things that like maybe, okay, so maybe eventually Queen Elizabeth is seen as being out, like outside the understanding of the times. But, the, you know, back at the beginning of her reign, there are these things that she did that were incredible mm-hmm. or, or these incredible moments all along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do feel like you could start to see the stacking of that argument to argue for them. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I think it just sort of comes back to this idea of everyone is flawed. Stop putting people on pedestals and maybe we just let people be humans. I don't know. But when they put themselves on a pedestal, that's really challenging. That's true. My very first blush reaction to the show is uh, about Diana. Like, I understand why it's Diana all the time right now, but I do feel like this has thrown off the balance of the show a little bit. I just really missed spending time with the other characters. Mm -hmm. Um, I was... Yeah, let me go ahead and say this because I think it's really related. Uh, a lot of this show is rewatchable for me because it's so detailed that you can miss things. Right. So I get to go back again and be like, oh, oh, oh. But I don't feel that way at all about these first four episodes. You don't think they're rewatchable? Not for me. Okay. So it's probably because you already talked about this. I very much remember 1997. I remember the day she died. I remember that being very affecting for me. And for that reason, the only suspense of these first four episodes was seeing how the show would unfold a story I already know. Mm-hmm. Once you know that, it feels like trauma porn. Yeah. And I, that is not something I want to relive over and over again. I actually put off even watching what I thought were going to be the first four episodes of season six because I knew the car crash was coming mm-hmm. and I wasn't sure I was ready for that. Um, because I thought it was going to be a little exhibitionist. Like I assumed they were going to be a little gratuitous with it because they really wanted to like make impact. So I was, I was scared of it. And like, I don't remember, I remember it. Like I said, I remember the funeral. I remember the circumstances. I've heard the story over time. It's not something I'm super excited to relive. Mm -hmm. So I really kind of put it off a little while. And so that's what really tipped me to like when I got halfway through and I was like, we haven't even gotten close to her crash yet. Like what's happening? Um, but I actually thought, for what it's worth, I thought that was really well handled. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting it to be. So I actually started rewatching from the beginning after I finished the fourth episode just to sort of go back because I was a little not in the right mind when I first started watching it. And I started rewatching it and I thought it was really well handled in that in that first episode and then again toward the end. It's a tall order, um, I think, to strike both of those things. To like, It's something that has to be done well, it doesn't have to be, but one would hope with some iota of accuracy, but also to be super respectful, Mm -hmm. but like also, like you said, to still have that impact. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, uh, I think, I think it was done very well. uh, Also, I think that some people don't feel that way, but what can you say? Right. Someone is always upset about something. Apparently they swore up and down that they would not show the crash. Yeah. And they really didn't. No, they didn't. You know, I mean, it was alluded to. You kind of saw it coming around the corner. They led up to it. But, um, you know, I think they they still had to find ways to interject that drama. Um, I agree with you. I, th- I, I think it was I think it was well done. I think this season also felt like the first one where I felt like I knew where we were in time. Mm-hmm. Like I identified with the time a little bit. The mm-hmm. first... Um, at the very beginning, Diana and William are driving and they're listening to tub thumping. Yes, there's so much. Walking 90s. on the Sun comes on later. It's Apparently, like every 90s song I wouldn't listen to again. Oh, God, I love the, both those songs. Today? Well, uh, they're, such, they're such bops. Yeah, I would listen to both of them. 
Uh, Smash Mouth Man. I guess you get me. I don't know. Um, okay. Will was listening to something on his headphones in the uh-huh. scenes in episode four. I read that it was something by Radiohead, which had been released just a few months before her death. So angsty. So they, yeah. One. They really leveraged music to put you in time. And sure. it worked for someone like me because I have such a catalog and a mental catalog of music. You couldn't go anywhere and not hear Tumblewumba. Well, I mean, it is it is so 1997. Yeah. That like it is maybe the most like representative song of that year. So I couldn't agree more with the song choice. To represent that time. Yeah, I, I would listen to it still. But it's the first season that I've watched and I felt like, oh, this makes sense to me now. Like I'm not watching an epic historical drama. Yeah. I'm watching I'm watching these days, even though it's not these days. Well, I think it was also to show a little bit of Diana's personality. She's the hip mom. Yeah. You know? She's cool mom. She knows tub whatever it is. Um Chumbawamba. <laughs> said tubawamba whatever (laughs) anyways okay so the fourth episode unearthed for me something i hadn't emotionally experienced in some time so this was another one of kind of my first blush reactions just to watching those first ones um and that's how her death had such a global impact it seemed it's like she unlocked some kind of feeling in people and the world seemed to all kind of grieve at once and um the sadness was palpable, and I felt that again in the fourth episode. And with them interjecting in, like, the real scenes of all the people coming to the gates. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, like, no matter how we feel about, like, the, again, that kind of uh, immortalizing of Diana and whether or not that was, whether or not that's fair, the sheer ability she had to bring that amount of people together is tremendous i had to ask kyle uh, i said did you hear me crying last night when i finished the fourth episode and he was like no i was straight up sobbing through that fourth episode when philip said to william william said Mm -hmm. um why are they crying for someone they don't even know he said they're not crying for her they're crying for you and that hit 15 layers of feels for me. And I think the world, part of that outpouring was for the boys and this overwhelming sadness of, I mean, in general, she was young, she was beautiful, she was vibrant, and she died. That's heartbreaking to watch. All the things she had been through in the press recently, heartbreaking that this was the end of it all. So I think it just, I think, you, like you said, it triggered something and people needed that release. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a favorite for me as well. Um, that part, what were some of your other favorite scenes? I thought, so going back to the, um, the car crash, the very opening scene where, uh, this man is just this regular person. I don't think we had any indication that he was anybody special. He was just a normal person going about his business, taking his dog for a walk. And that walk coincided with possibly the most influential car crash of modern history. Mm. And that was like kind of this beautiful, like putting this magnetic, uh, magnificent and like historic family alongside a normal person, this normal person watching this. Um, and then that choice to fade to black, but leave the horn honking after the accident was such an, a powerful choice. So I really liked that, that opening scene, which they came back to obviously in episode four. Mm-hmm. I also really liked um, the the second and last one I'll mention is there was one part in episode four where they overlaid Diana's landmine walk with the yacht photo shoot situation mm-hmm. um, where she and Dodie, it may be, it may have been episode three actually now that I'm saying it, mm-hmm. where they were um, on the yacht and the pictures, the paparazzi pictures are being taken of them. I kind of took a step back and thought about that from a conceptual level. And that was a really beautiful pairing landmines are dangerous this relationship she's into is dangerous and she's walking she's towing this really dangerous and tenuous line and overlaying those two together when you take that step back you're like holy crap what a like mind-blowing two moments in her life to put together that had such strong parallels okay yeah i think this show really likes that yeah i I love those things mm -hmm. they like to bifurcate um and kind of uh pair up different things that have similarities but aren't similar 
to kind of give the audience that really important juxtaposition. Um, so I think for me in episode two, favorite scenes where Charles talks with Diana outside of the car, they agree to get along. And he said, he's proud of her for the landmine campaign and in Bosnia, speaking of the landmine campaign, it just, I don't know. It just felt like a final nice moment for them, uh, which I think also kind of is a nice build up to something. If you're just talking about the dramatic tones and not necessarily the real life, whatever that they all of the first three episodes are building up her, her sadness, but also she's trying to grow. She's trying to change. And so I think helping the audience really kind of understand just how monumental this next thing is going to be and, and really draw the lines for us, why it's so tragic. And it's not just because it's a death. Uh, this will have some overlap with our next category, but when Prince Charles go to, goes to identify Diana's body in Paris, and um, when Queen Elizabeth reads her statement about Diana over the visual of the funeral procession, those were favorite scenes for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think we know one of the biggest tear-jerking moments for you. Are there any others that had you worried if Kyle heard you crying from the room? <laughs> I think the... Um the scene setting stuff, the really like um, dramatic choices they made got me sometimes. So uh, there were two moments this season, specifically you just mentioned when the surgeon told Charles Diana had died. And then when Charles was breaking the news to the boys, um, rather than rely on dialogue or try to ever mm -hmm. rebuild what actually happened there, mm -hmm. they went to just music playing and just watching the interaction. And I think that's just such a beautiful creative choice, one, to get them out of having to write what was probably an impossible scene, but also to allow your mind to fill in the gaps a little bit and allow you to fully, that's probably what it sounded like to those poor boys when they heard their mom had died was like complete silence. And I just thought that was kind of a beautiful choice. And so that made me weepy. Uh, and then, of course, Charles said in episode uh, four, they asked if he had told the boys yet. And he said, no, he was letting them sleep while they're sleeping. They still have a mother. Yeah, that was sad. Get me again. Oh, my gosh. How horrible. Yeah. But those were the those were the ones that I really pulled out. What about you? Yeah, I just it's just really anything in episode four is up for grabs. Oh, that's so, a tough watch. Yeah, the whole thing, just front to back, is just really tough. And um, so two moments I've already mentioned, but even that very first phone call that reaches Balmoral, and this is kind of like mm. a crown, uh, <laughs> a crown regular event where it takes a long time for a phone call to reach the queen mm -hmm. or anyone special. How it's, disconnected they are. Yeah, and so you kind of go through these things of it reaching the right people and of course it's in the middle of the night and then you just kind of see them like sleepily come down the stairs and you just know something horrible is about to all happen. the lights in the palace came on amazing yeah. uh moo moo with Dodie in the coroner's office was heartbreaking uh i mentioned this too but the real life footage of everyone showing up at the palace gates i thought that was really well used mm -hmm. um so those were some of them for me what were the best performances for you so far uh, that those scenes in Paris where they're short, sort of shuttling between locations with the paparazzi and there's attention everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, when they sit down at the restaurant, Diana is, you've watched her clearly. Each scene is building and she's getting more anxious and she's getting more overwhelmed. And she sits down at the dinner table and it finally all starts to pour out of her. Mm -hmm. But she also has to balance but she's like this very public figure and people are watching her and that's not what they want to see and not what they expect. And she has to hold it together. That whole bit for me, I felt the anxiety and I felt the stress. And I thought that um, Elizabeth Debicki, Debicki? Mm -hmm. her performance was in that, that particular set of scenes was so amazing. If she's not on your list, <laughs> I would just be surprised for My for Elizabeth Debicki to not be on someone's best performance list. Yeah. I mean, she's the alpha and the omega of these episodes. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, yeah. but she, when we were talking about favorite cast members, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think it's weighted a little heavy on the Diana side for a, a lot of things. Um, but she was such an amazing 
Diana. Like she just was Diana. She did such a beautiful job. The head tip. Someone went, <laughs> one of the reviews I read was just like, um, you know, if you can get past the fact that she's, you know, six foot four, taller than Dodie, skinnier than Diana ever was, and you can only tilt your head so many times. And I was like, oh, come on now. Like she was doing a beautiful job. She, if I don't, you go back and look at Diana, her head's tipped a lot. Mm-hmm. So I think what that was was a really close character study. I mean, yeah, she is taller and she is very tall. Yeah. But Diana was very tall. Yeah. So um, she did beautifully. I mean, just absolutely. So I had like the poise, the elegance, but the playfulness. But also there's like just this sadness right behind the eyes, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I beautiful. Uh, my other favorite was Dominic West as Prince Charles. I just... I, first of all, he's the only other person that got screen time, except for Dodie. So right. we just don't really spend a lot of time with any of the other characters. Um, I am saying something that a lot of people have said. Uh, Dominic West in that role is a very big glow up. Um, mm-hmm. He is a very charismatic actor. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he's also friends with Prince Charles. I learned. Awkward. Um, so he doesn't. You know, he doesn't really have that much to do until the fourth episode, but he just burns up the screen every single time mm-hmm. uh, for me. So those are my two tops in the first four episodes. Uh, Claudia Harrison. So she portrayed Anne. And I said earlier with costumes, like she looks like Anne. Sure. But there were also just a few little tiny pieces of performance that were so like what I do know about Anne is this is what she seems like. Mm-hmm. So there was a the part where they run out to go find for find William. He's missing and they're all going to look for him and everybody's panicking and everybody and out of like you can just hear her. They're not focused on her. You just hear her like out in the ether. She says, all right, no need to panic. And it was just very like... <laughs> It was very Anne. I don't know. So like practical and low drama. And I just really, I really liked that. Every time she was on screen, I, I loved watching her scenes. Very good. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think, and that's, that's fair. I, you don't really get as much of her, but she does make a meal of every time that she's there. And I like her interact, her interactions with Charles in terms of just them being siblings is this is coming from someone without a sibling, but it feels so siblingy. Sibling adjacent, as much as they can be good siblings, I think. I did like um, Khalid Abdallah, who played Dodie. Mm-hmm. I don't want to gloss over him. So I don't feel like he says it at one point. Like it, it, his story was never really told. And he and his dad, I think when they're having the ghost scene, they talk about how um, his story was just never going to be told. It was always going to be about the princess. It was always going to be about the white lady. Like it was always going to be about her. Um, But there was some story to him that they told, which I thought was beautiful. I don't know very much about him. To his point, there's not much said about him or his story that has resonated with me, that has kind of filtered down to me. I'm sure people have covered it. It didn't filter to me for probably a million reasons. But I really loved every time he was on screen. I liked what he was doing with the character. I thought he was really well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I don't think there was any... Mm. Let me not say that. I had, there Careful were a couple now. There were a couple performances that didn't work for me, but yeah. on the whole, um, all the people that we saw the most, I thought were just really doing a, a great a really job, good job. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, I actually, I have to ask you this though. This is just, are you ready for something truly off oh, the cuff? Gosh, I don't know. Is it weird to you that they just kind of let William? I know they searched for a little bit, but then they were like, Casey and I both the look at each king other. Of England. They're all back inside, like warming by the fire. And Casey and I looked at each other and we were like, they're just going to leave him out there. Just leave him out there. And then it, like later, they're like, he was out there 17 hours. I'm like, because you didn't have the National Guard looking for him or whatever they're called in the UK. But like, yeah, that was weird. Uh, okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, I was like, is this, is this right? That was such a weird, uh, unnecessary side story in my opinion this is like he said, didn't no really do that though. it it was unnecessary uh, there were a couple of those yeah um i think in this one did he leave for 17 hours was that validated i don't ugh, flippity flop if I they're gonna remember. mount such a huge search mm-hmm. that everyone shy of the queen went out looking for him mm-hmm. uh Anne was out harry was out charles was out everyone shy not of a her. <laughs> She's cold. She doesn't care about people. But if everybody else was looking for him, then they are not going to just give up after 
an hour and a half or two hours or whatever. And, yeah, or like at least like give us like sixteen hours later. <laughs> exactly. And then they're like, tell me something that lets me know yeah. that they look for more than thirty. He's minutes. coming back. Let it be dark. <laughs> it felt like it was still light outside. Yeah. Now it, it now I will say it like depending on the time of year it gets dark really late like 10 30 but give me a time stamp or something man I, so i don't think they didn't care about this kid i get that the point was to make the point that he was lost and confused and didn't know what to do i you almost could have just said that like and then william disappeared for 17 hours you know like you didn't we didn't need them all going out to look for him yeah that was a huge plot hole yeah um okay so i don't <laughs> I don't know if this category is going to matter for you now, to be <laughs> honest, Nikki. It's okay. I've got stuff. But um, so particularly in the earlier seasons, we wind up getting a bit of a history lesson. Uh, what was your big history lesson from season five? You can tell us. I have. So I have <laughs> no. I, I am started, a little curious. I started with that first episode where um, Philip is like randomly at that woman's house and like they never actually say that it's like a godson situation. The, the child the dies. Goddaughter. Yeah. The, and so like I had to look all that up. So like, why are we at this? Why are they chariot racing? Like what is happening? Doesn't matter. I Carriage. I gave up. Carriage I gave up. racing. What I will say is I, have, I wish they were chariot <laughs> racing. Things. It's a chariot all the same. Three things I'll mention here. Okay. Not a lesson learned necessarily, more of an unanswerable question. But Dodie and Megan, this season makes it very clear that I think that uh, Diana had no interest in long-term relationship with Dodie. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not. I thought I don't think anybody really. I don't think knows. anybody really yeah. knows. I think it's all based on people who were close to her that had had conversations. But I can trust that about as much as I can trust anything. I can't trust, you know. Right. Yeah. People that are close to her, willing to sell that out in conversation. I don't know that I trust their opinion. But right. if they had ended up together, would Dodie and Megan have had a thing or two to talk about at Christmas dinner? In terms Who's, of, are you talking about the woman he was engaged to, Megan Markle, Dodie Fayed? And Meghan Markle, if they had hung around and if they had met each other, would they have had things to talk about in terms of the racism in the media that he experienced? He alludes to that, uh -huh. um, feeling like an outsider to the family. Okay. Sorry, I'm adjusting my brain because that just totally went. I'm like, who's Megan? <laughs> From okay, one outsider so to really, another. really, we're talking about like a piece down the road. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good question I say, yeah. unanswerable question sure I like an unanswerable question though I also wanted to know if the boys really had to go to church right after they heard Diana died I was so annoyed by that I would have been I would have not gone I would have been like you're just gonna and Casey was like you have no idea what it's like to be part of the royal family <laughs> Casey does Casey gets it it was something like that where I was like <laughs> I was like, yeah, and I do what I want. <laughs> and that's what makes me American. I found a town and country article that confirmed they did have to go. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is just like, get out of here. That you was can, wild. You can skip church. That was The day after wild. someone close to you, particularly your mother, passes. And there was no, as far as I remember, it struck me that there was no conversation about why everyone needed to go to church. I imagine it was to appear unruffled. I imagine it was to appear as a united front. It was a terrible choice, especially if the queen said that her goal was to take care of the family that was there. Why did she make them go to church? Yeah, I assure you God will understand. It was a terrible choice. Uh, yeah. The last thing I wanted to know was, did anyone really hear Charles crying at the hospital? Oh, uh -huh. So town and country part confirmed of part of this. Uh -huh. It was actually at Balmoral, where staff heard him weeping openly. A nurse at the hospital did share that his face was ashen like he'd been hit in the face. So. Yeah. So, okay. So this is where my post watch Googling led me. It was all about unpacking what was accurate and not accurate from these first four episodes. Now, there's mm -hmm. tons that we can pull from, but the one that really I was looking into initially was um, and what was the most standout for me was the show turning Muhammad Al-Fayed, um, our Mumu, our beloved Mumu from season Mumu. five, into a villain. I like met a, him. <laughs> into, like they turn him into what feels like a straight up Bond villain or something in this, in these first episodes. Uh, I've, uh, you know, um, 
And I'm adding this with a question mark because I don't know that the showrunners agree that with my take that they've turned him into a villain. We don't know each other, but it's how it reads to me. Oh, it's definitely, it's definitely how it reads. Okay. So let's just call it a strange decision when they work so hard in season five to humanize this man, you know, actually that was going to be one of my favorite episodes, but I decided to keep everything and take in with season four but the episode where he gets the valet, who was the valet of the oh. guy who abdicated, mm-hmm. the guy who abdicated. <laughs> that I old hear, king. I hear myself. Um, <laughs> Edward? Yeah. So, um, yeah, but which number? And right. That's where it gets, that's where confusing. It gets confusing. Yeah. So, anyways, that episode is so beautiful yeah. and so lovely, and he takes care of him when he's, he's sick, and I'm just saying they do all of that, and then in this final season, they put him in the center of events that lead to Diana and Dodie's death, his own son, pushing them together in the first place, asking staff to see if they're having sex, mm-hmm. hiring the sleaziest photographer, this hunter of celebrities who will do anything to take what becomes the kiss photos, which in turn further inflame paparazzi interest in diana and Dodie, blah 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 so it turns out there is no evidence he was behind those kiss photos many actually believe that diana probably hired the photographer in an attempt to make the man she really loved hasnot khan jealous Mm. so now we don't know that's true either and i have more thoughts about that but for right now that final night of her and Dodie's life may have been more of a perfect storm versus the sordid orchestration of a power hungry father. Mm -hmm. You know, here's what I learned from an excerpt of the, of Tina Brown's book, the palace papers published in vanity fair. So Diana no longer had round the clock protection. This was apparently her decision and not the palaces as is sometimes reported. And I'm not blaming one way or another. We're just talking about things that could have led to this night. Protection was instead provided by Dodie's security who wouldn't know how to work the press outline where she was going and what would happen these are things that her protection officer and chauffeur standardly did so they knew where to be and when to be there in order to get the pictures that they were sometimes brought in to do and some believe this information would have prevented the chase that ensued i think a 22 2022 vox article puts into words what is coming up for me this season And this is all quoted from there. It's not that the crown is largely false, but rather that it's usually pretty on the money. Because it's so often right, the show's fictional liberties merge seamlessly with the truth and make it easy to take the whole series as gospel. And so, this is me again, I guess it's one thing for Charles to read a poem he didn't actually read at Camilla's birthday party. This is another fictional liberty. But it feels like a different kind of a thing to pin so much of that lead up to the night in Paris on one person the story reads much more complicated to me so and then one other history lesson for me was revisiting the official british inquest into princess diana's death which initially opened in 2004 and closed in 2008 i had just forgotten all of the conspiracy theories around her death including one theory that the royal family was behind it mm-hmm. we'll link to an article but the court explored several different sensational allegations and ultimately the jury found that diana and Dodie were unlawfully killed by the grossly negligent uh, driving of chauffeur henry paul and paparazzi photographers pursuing their limousine into a paris road tunnel in 1997 It was so confusing to me, and I don't understand paparazzi at all. I I don't understand what was happening that night in particular. But, like, how do you get to a point where you're being chased through a tunnel? Why not just stop and let them take a picture, you know, or just pull over to the side of the road and hope they go away or call the police? I don't know. I feel like you're, I mean, well, it racing down a two lane road isn't the answer. It doesn't help that the driver was several drinks right. in, right? Right. And, and that was a very, that was um, a big deal. It, well, but it's a blink and miss, blink and you miss it situation in the episode, oh, though. Oh, if you weren't drinks. watching and you didn't see how many cups were sitting there, I think you'd miss and that he had been drinking. And that's actually from a receipt. So in the inquest, he had had like, there are two. They're like at some kind of French liqueur and they mm. had two of those on there, but people actually think he had been drinking more. And it's like a, it's like a whole, 
narrative just around that. You could have missed that pretty easily, I think, in the show. Absolutely. It almost felt more like an Easter egg than Uh a plot point. I agree. That was all my history lessons. Okay. Um, so there's so much to say yeah I'm trying to well and so i i think we were going to do some at least attempt to do some predictions although yeah. more and more i feel like it's leaking out into the media about what we can expect to see but do, yeah do you have any thoughts or so you actually shared with me earlier this week that the last bit will only go through 2005 That's i saw that in some like follow-up as well um I was really holding out for Will and Kate's wedding and like maybe some of the build up to that. So I guess we're not going to get that. Uh, I guess at a minimum, we'll get a peek into their early relationship. So I guess I'll look forward to that. I don't know. I guess we'll see Charles and Camilla get married. I got to be honest. I don't really know what was happening with the royal family from like Diana's death until probably Will and Kate. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know too much. I remember, I remember Charles and Camilla getting married, but like... It's sort of a so what mm-hmm. in my in my opinion in my very American very non British opinion mm-hmm. sort of like a so what so that's sort of what I'm expecting what what are you thinking about well I have to give uh, full credit to the Ringers Prestige TV podcast um, because they've been doing some deep dives and I I'm not as good as you so I couldn't help myself and oh. I listened anyway but I really tried to formulate my own opinions and that's why I'm giving them credit on where credit is due. Um, but I think they had a really solid guess, which is that the show is likely to end with Camilla and Charles's wedding. Um, and it sounds like this has been further confirmed. Boring. Since then. <laughs> well, take it up with Peter Morgan. Wasn't even a fun royal wedding. Like they had to do everything on the DL because they didn't want to make a big production of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I so, mean, good for them. I'm happy. I'm happy for them. Sure, sure. I, seriously, watching his story unfold. It feels like his and Diana's lives were messed with, messed with mm-hmm. significant, significantly and ruined in some instances. So it seems like he found his happy ending. And I think everybody deserves that. All the way ruined. Like in some respects. Exactly. You know, so I mean, I'm not talking about Charles. Um, I, it sounds like he's found his happy ending. Um, it's also been widely reported Good for him. that <laughs> filming of the season was paused after Qu- Queen Elizabeth died mm-hmm. last year. And that Peter Morgan changed the ending after her death. Oh, interesting. I will have to say I was a little confused by that because I'm like, okay, but it's like almost 20 years before she died. Right. But I think maybe, I who knows how it was written and maybe, I don't know. But anyways, that apparently has taken place. Uh, and then from the trailer, you know, in, in addition to the fact that we do already know, we see Kate Middleton's see-through dress, or whatever, uh-huh. which was a big deal at the time. <laughs> it's a big production. Yes. Yeah. Um, but, like, we're also going to, it indicates that we're going to see William dealing with newfound press oh. interest mm-hmm. and his seemingly unwanted teen heartthrob status. So uh, I had a poster. <laughs> so I do think we're getting a pretty big pivot to his life. Okay. And then my only prediction was, to your point, I don't know what was going on with the royal family in 05. So I did some quick Googling, and he does graduate that year. Mm-hmm. And so it's possible we see that happen as well and maybe see some interaction between him Yay. and the family. I don't know. Yeah, some of these just seem so like, and then there was Easter. <laughs> they had a picnic. I was will say. Day. Thinking about the show as a whole, we watched mm-hmm. Diana, I'm sorry, we watched Elizabeth literally put the crown on her head for the first time. It's a choice to end before we get to see it end, before it really ends, knowing that we've all lived in a lifetime to see it end. She, I know she died very recently. I know the show was already slated to end. So it's impossible in four or five episodes to cover, to your point, 20 years worth of stuff. But it's a real choice to not cover some of the more recent stuff. You know why that is? Or do you? I don't. I get, in maybe. your reading. Okay. <laughs> tell, <laughs> we'll me, see. tell me and then I'll tell you if I know. <laughs> um, okay. So. my Can I say my presumption would be because it's really almost impossible to cover something living and breathing and have it feel any sort of true because so much of it at this point is conjecture. 
I think that's part of it. I think the other part is Peter Morgan has been pretty vocal about this, that he didn't want. So I was actually surprised about 05 because we're not technically 20 years from 05, but that's basically his rule. Oh, we talked about this. Mm -hmm. I think around Harry and Meghan. We talked about this. So 20 years out is where he feels like it can be more um, objective one, but also he doesn't want it to be journalistic. Okay. And he feels like when you start to encroach on those closer time periods it becomes more of a journalism investigation versus um like a dramatic storytelling well i'll be interested to see how he changed the ending because i had not heard that there was any sort of adjustment to the ending after the queen's death to your point who knows what that's going to look like it'll be interesting to see that because i couldn't help thinking what it feels like a missed opportunity to not commemorate her death in some way because we have watched her entire Rain. That's right. So I, I think that this was to mend that to somehow give some kind of nod. And mm-hmm. I don't know what that'll look like. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like Could you, you know, imagine having having that job to figure out how to do that? There's so many jobs. So many. I, I'm not sure I can figure out, including my own sometimes. Um, so I guess whatever way it plays out, we'll find out soon enough uh, what the crown has in store for the six remaining episodes we'll keep you posted on when you can expect that breakdown to happen again it's going to be after the holidays me too after holiday (laughs) it's looking like uh early january then so hopefully that gives everyone time to watch and process a little bit and catch up on the end of season five (laughs) all right but you know the drill dm us email us or contact us from the website find us all over the socials and that's this week's extra royal extra sugar